Good evening and welcome to the Wednesday night Bible study of Riverside Baptist Church. As we continue our study through the book of Esther. If you remember last week was not a very good week for Haman. He had had to lead uh, Mordecai through the streets and point him out as the man that the king wanted to honor. And uh, if things couldn't get any worse, uh, he was invited to the second banquet with the queen, uh, thinking that he was going to receive some special honor. And boy, he did. Uh, the queen threw him under the bus as she said, he's the man who's plotting against my people and against me and uh, wants to annihilate us. The king was furious. And if you recall, Haman was hung on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Tonight, we continue our look at uh, the book of Esther and see what happens to the Jews. Can they be saved? Will they be saved? Can this edict that the king produced earlier under the guise and, and leadership of Haman be reversed? Let's look at the story beginning with verse 1 in chapter 8 of the book of Esther. On that day, the day that Haman had uh, been put to death, on that day, King Ahasuerus gave Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told the king how he was related to her. So the king took off his signet ring, which he had yet taken from Haman, and he gave it to Mordecai, and Esther appointed Mordecai over the house of Haman. Now Esther spoke again to the king and fell on his down at his feet and implored him with tears to counteract the evil that Haman had, the Agiite, and the scheme that he had devised against the Jews. The king extended his scepter towards Esther, so Esther rose and stood before the king. Father, as we continue this saga of Esther and her plea for her people, uh, we see the intensity coming about. Yes, Haman has been put to death, but can this plot be stopped? Can it be foiled? Is there anything that can be done now to save the Jews from total annihilation? We thank you that you've given us this story and for the application that it has in our lives. Help us to understand that tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There is a continuing saga here as... Esther saves her people. She goes before the king and asks for this edict to be re removed or, or changed. But before she can do that, the king honors Mordecai. Remember, Mordecai has already saved his life once. And now, in this most recent time, he gives the house of Haman to his queen. And the queen, in verse 2, gives the house to Mordecai. Now, Mordecai is promoted to chief prince, perhaps, because he's given the royal robes. He's given the royal uh, treatment. He's given the royal ring, the signet ring that had belonged to uh, Haman. He is given all the things that Haman had in the court of the king. He is promoted to a high place of leadership. You see, sometimes we want to get ahead in life, don't we? We want to scheme and, and do whatever we can, cut corners and, and get better and, and make it to the top. Mordecai didn't do that. Mordecai just stayed faithful to God, faithful to his beliefs, faithful to the Jewish faith. And in that faithfulness, God rewarded him ultimately to a place that he could not even have imagined that he would be one day. And as if that wasn't enough, in the last part of verse 2, Esther, she has no need for another home, another residence, and all of the other things that go along with it. She gives that home of, Mor of Haman to Mordecai. So now, I don't know, we don't know what kind of residence Mordecai lived in, but now he's given the house of Haman. And that means all of the servants, all of the wealth, everything that had belonged to Haman now belonged to Mordecai who was Haman's arch enemy. If you recall back in chapter 3 when we were looking at this plot unfolding and Haman coming before the king, he says to the king, there are a group of people who want to annihilate you, that want to uh, disobey all of your rules. That was a lie. But he brought about this plot to destroy the Jews and he says, if the king pleases to do this, 
I will give the king 10,000 talents of silver. Well, we're not exactly sure uh, what amount of silver that was in today's uh, funding. But we do know it was quite a lot of money. Some have estimated that 10 talents of silver would have been equal to about 75 tons of silver today. Uh, some have said it would be equal to $4.5 billion. Whatever amount it was, it was a huge sum to be put into the king's treasury if he signed this edict, which he did. And Haman had plenty of money left over. He was not going to give every dime he had. And so now Mordecai, Haman's arch enemy, receives all of this wealth, all of this prestige, all of this power and authority from the king. And the queen still has the request. She bows before the king and she asks him to spare her people. She said, if it please the king, verse 5, and if I have found favor in your sight, if it seems right with the king, Please let letters be written to revoke the letters that were written by Haman and distributed throughout all the land. She requests that her people be saved. For in verse 6 she says, How can I endure to see evil that will come upon my people? Or how can I see such destruction of my countrymen? Unfortunately, the order cannot be rescinded. Unfortunately, what has been written has been written. And the king, even the king, cannot change his mind. But he can alter the circumstances. And so new orders are issued. In verses 7 and following, King Ahasuerus says to King Esther and Mordecai the Jew, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the gallows because he tried to lay hands on the Jews. You yourselves write a decree. You decide what's going to happen. You write the decree. You use my signet ring that I have given to Mordecai. Set my signet on it along with my name and no one can revoke the order that you wrote. In verse 9, the king's scribes were called in at that time. It was the third month of the year. Now remember, it was to be the twelfth month, the month Adar, when the Jews were put to death. When the month of Sivan, the third month, fell on the 23rd day, it was written according to all that Mordecai had commanded to the Jews. And the satraps, the governors, the princes, the whole people in all of the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 of them to be exact, in their own dialect, each scribe, took and wrote in their own dialect of the people so there could be no misunderstanding, no confusion. The word was clear of what they were to do. In verse 10, he wrote the name of King Ahasuerus, sealed it with the signet ring, and sent letters to all of the people and all of the land on swift steeds. What was that edict? What did... Mordecai and Esther come up with as a plan? Their plan was simple. Verse 11, by these letters that they were sending out, the king permitted the Jews in every city to protect themselves. You see, up to this point, they didn't have that right. People could come in and slay them, and they didn't have the right to protect themselves. But now the king says, you have a right to protect yourself. You know when it's going to happen. You know where it's going to happen, in your own cities, in your own homes. You have a right to protect yourself. And it went on to say, to destroy, to kill, to annihilate all of the forces of the people of the province who would assault the Jews, the children, and the women, and to plunder their possessions. King Ahasuerus had allowed that to be signed, sealed, and delivered, that they could be protected from their adversaries. They had the right to kill everyone in their province. A copy of the document, verse, 12 say, uh, verse 13 says, was issued and a decree was given to every province and published to all the people in all the lands that they could avenge themselves. The couriers 
who rode on royal horses, went out and hastened and pressed by the king's command. The decree was issued in Sush from Shushan, the citadel, out to all the provinces. They had time to get there and begin the process of defending themselves. They were told that they could do this. And in verse 15, Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel, dressed in blue and white with a great crown on his head. Can't you imagine what Haman would have loved to have been arrayed in? This is what he wanted. This is what Haman wanted for himself. The royal garments, the crown on his head, the royal steed, the linen and purple garments of, uh, that were a fine linen. That's what Haman wanted. But now Haman's swinging from a gallows. And Mordecai has received the honor. And the Jews had a light and glad spirit among themselves. And in all of the provinces under the king's command, where the decree was heard, the Jews began to celebrate the fact that they could now defend themselves. The spirit of gloom and despair had now turned into a spirit of celebration and joyfulness because the people realized their enemies might be after them, but they had God on their side. They had the right to defend themselves. Just remember, Regardless what happens, there can be celebration in our life. There can be that joyous time of celebration as we trust God working in our life. You know, I love it when a plan comes together. In the 1980s TV show, The A-Team, a group of misfits, uh, individuals running from the law themselves for crimes that they had not committed, formed together a group of men who fought against evil and may have been uh, kidnapping someone who had been previously kidnapped and saving their life or, or some other exploit, but it was an, a time of intrigue and involved all kinds of shenanigans that they went through and, and displaying different people. But at the end of the program, Hannibal Smith, who was the leader of the A-Team, always was smoking his cigar and he would say, I love it when a plan comes together. You know, I love it when God's plan comes together. We could have tried to write a saga about Haman and Mordecai and Esther and figure out how all of this was going to come out. But none of us, I don't believe, could have come up with a, an ending or a near ending. The story hasn't ended yet that would match what God has done. And so I want you tonight to take away from this study the fact that regardless of what situation you may be in right now, what you may be facing, just know God is still in control. We're in some strange and difficult times. I'm 69 years old. I've never seen anything like what we're going through now. Stores still under limited occupancy and there's still things we can't do and uh, wondering what the uh, COVID-19 is going to be tomorrow if we're going to go back into quarantine and having to wear the mask and, and they're very frustrating. I understand that. Uh, I don't like wearing those masks. Every time I put one on, I have a choice to make. I can either breathe or I can see because they fog up my glasses and I kind of like doing both, but it's difficult times. And it doesn't matter whether it's the COVID-19 that is your problem or difficulty or a problem with a neighbor, friend, family member, or someone else. Whatever you are facing right now, it could be a health issue. Remember, God is still in control. He has never been out of control. God understands. God knows what you have need of, and he's on your side. He wants what's best for you. And just like Esther and Mordecai trusted God, Will you trust him? Will you allow him to work in your heart and your life today? Next time, we're going to see the conclusion of this story. Were the Jews able to protect themselves? Were any of them, and if so, how many of the Jews were annihilated during this process? Were the Persians 
running in fear? Or did they suffer harm and danger? How does the story end? We'll find out next week. Father, thank you for your blessings, your watch care, and the understanding that you are still in control. You have always been in control. You have never been out of control. So help us to rely on you, turn all of our burdens, all of our problems, all of our difficulties over to you, and let you work in our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.